This video is sponsored by Squarespace. What made Medusa a monster? Was it her power to petrify the living, the snakes that adorned her head, her womanhood, or her status as a victim, a victim who survived and grew more powerful after her trauma and abuse? If we choose to deconstruct the feminist psyche, one of the first images we would draw from its shadows would be that of Medusa's decapitated head, either lying on the floor, held up in the air by her hair in the hands of her murderer, or immortalized onto the shield of Athena or Caravaggio. Medusa has been employed as a trope of female sexuality and as an exemplar for how the male gaze structures human perceptions of women for centuries. Though she embodies the antidote to the male gaze's deadly toxin, mythology ensures that her existence is eradicated by the hero, the patriarchal pinnacle of perfection. Modern culture has spent the large majority of its time either psychoanalyzing her anger and petrifying powers through misogynistic or feministic lenses, but her earliest textual significance and symbols are lesser known. So let's discuss those, shall we? My name is Chinsia and welcome to my library. If you are new here, hello. I hope you are doing splendidly. And if you're one of my lovely regulars, I hope you are having an even more fantastic day. Today, we are going to be talking about Medusa, thanks to the suggestions from Charlotte Rachel, Ice Rabbit 9 and Inez. I really appreciate this request. So let's get into the myth of the Gorgon in general. The amphora of Nessus in the Archaeological Museum of Athens has preserved one of the traditional images of the Gorgon. The monster, fitted out with two great wings, a broad, flattened head, a large mouth, fangs, a protruding tongue, and a mane of hair. Now, before we look at Medusa herself, we need to look at the earliest literary references to a Gorgon of her nature. And those are actually referenced in Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. The Iliad, dating approximately 750 BCE, references an unnamed Gorgon on Athena's Aegis. And an Aegis has been interpreted as either a shield or, in some cases, an animal skin. Athena's Aegis depicts fear, strife and, quote, the gorgon head of a terrible monster, terrible and fearful, a portent of the Aegis holding Zeus. Homer's gorgon isn't mentioned as having snakes for hair or even wings, but she is later paired with a snake in the Iliad when on Agamemnon's shield, quote, and on it was put as a crown the gorgon, with ferocious face, with dreadful glance, and about her were terror and flight. A shield strap of silver was attached to it, and there also was coiled upon it a dark blue snake. In Book 11 of the Odyssey, Odysseus describes Gorgon, saying a pale, lit yellow-green dread seized me lest illustrious Persephone might send forth upon me from the house of Hades, the head of the Gorgon, the terrible monster. Interestingly, scholars believe that the Gorgon Medusa and Perseus myth wasn't known at the time of the Iliad or the Odyssey being written, which was around circa 725 BCE, as Perseus and the Gorgon are referenced in both the Iliad and the Odyssey, but never together. Then, around 700 BCE, Medusa and Perseus are connected in Hesiod's Theogony. Quote, Medusa, suffering miseries. She was mortal, but the two sisters were immortal and ageless. With this woman, that is Medusa, lay the dark blue haired one, Poseidon, in a soft meadow in the midst of the spring of flowers. Remember this quote from Hesiod because it comes up later in the video. But before we go any further, I'd like to say a quick thank you to today's sponsor, Squarespace. I have built all of my main websites over the past few years with Squarespace because I love how intuitive and easy it makes website design and layout. I don't know anything about coding, which has made using other website platforms um, incredibly frustrating. But with Squarespace, I can drag and drop my content where I want it. If you're a creator who wants to expand your revenue stream, Squarespace is 
an all-in-one platform that makes it easy for you to monetize your content and expertise in a way that fits your brand. So first, Squarespace member area lets you sell your courses or classes to your followers. Squarespace also has an inbuilt email campaign option where you can collect email subscribers and convert them into loyal customers. Additionally, the built-in analytics feature gives you insight into who's visiting your site, traffic sources, time spent on site, most read content, audience geography, and much more. It's incredible to have all these powerful features in one space. So if you want to expand your business or just build a beautiful website for your blogging leisure, then build your next website with Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And then when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash lady of the library to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. And now let's go back into the video. So now let's focus more on Medusa herself. The myth of Medusa appears in various versions, from Hesiod as we just mentioned, and Apollodorus to Ovid and Lucan. But the myth remains largely the same despite some significant or small differences between them. Medusa was originally once a beautiful mortal woman, with long flowing hair, who served as one of the three virgins devoted to the goddess Athena. As Miriam Dexter explains, philologically speaking, the name Medusa means the ruling one. But by the time of the earliest Greek text which contains her myth, including those of Homer, Medusa was a monster associated with Hades. In the poetry of Hesiod, Medusa becomes the only mortal Gorgon among three Gorgon sisters, the other two being Theno and Euryale. The adjective Gorgos means terrible, fierce, and frightful. Medusa was apparently so beautiful that the god Poseidon fell in love with her. The most renowned version of Medusa's story comes from Ovid's Metamorphosis, where Poseidon, our words Medusa, obviously, i.e. against her will in Athena's temple, impregnating her. Furious that her temple was defiled, Athena naturally punishes the victim, cursing her with a monstrous ugliness and transforming her into a gorgon with snakes for hair. This is obviously very different from the Hesiod version of events, where Poseidon and Medusa consensually make love in a meadow of flowers. And many scholars believe that Ovid actually relocated the myth to Athena's temple specifically to explain why Athena now bears Medusa on her aegis. Like all myths, there isn't one official correct form of this. Hesiod, for example, doesn't discuss her head bearing snakes, but by the time the Greek poet Pindar was penning his odes circa 500 BCE, serpents were firmly affixed to the Gorgon's head, in myth as well as art. This is also when Medusa's head became associated with petrification, i.e. turning humans and eventually even animals to stone. The Greek historian Herodotus, circa 560 to 420 BCE, connected Perseus and the Gorgon and placed them in Libya, recalling how the people of Chemis in Egypt spoke of how Perseus came to Egypt to slay Medusa before bringing her head to Greece. In the classical era of Greece, the city walls and temples were adorned with the potropaic artifices of Gorgons as symbols of protection. And it was during this period, circa 480 to 407 BCE, that Euripides wrote his plays. In his play, Ion, there are multiple references to Gorgon heads around the walls of the temple. And Creusa, the queen of Athens, describes an embroidered robe, remarking that it has a Gorgon in the middle threads of the robe. It is bordered with serpents in the manner of Aegis. In the play, we also learn about the function of Medusa's blood. The Queen of Athens tells an old servant about two drops of Medusa's blood, and much like the venom of the snake, it has different functions. One drop is lethal, apparently, and the second drop heals. In the 2nd century BCE, Apollodorus builds on the discussion of Medusa's blood, explaining that the blood that flowed through the Gorgon's left side could destroy humanity, whilst the blood that flowed through her right side could save it. 
Obviously, it's not how blood flows to the body, but you get the idea. It's from Apollodorus that we also get a more descriptive iconography of the Gorgon, which he describes as having heads twined around with the horny scales of serpents and large teeth like those of boars. Presumably, he's discussing tusks here and bronze hands and golden wings by means of which they flew and they turned to stone those who looked upon them. The imagery of Medusa has connections with a stretch of European and Near Eastern Neolithic cultures, particularly Neolithic shamanic figures and demonic and death figures throughout Europe. In the Neolithic period throughout Europe and the Near East, there appear figures which represent bird-slash-women and snake-slash-women and bird-slash-snake-slash-woman hybrids. As Dexter explains, since goddesses with bird and snake iconography appear in early historic religions, such as those in Egypt and Mesopotamia, scholars have theorised that these figures represent divine figures in Neolithic cultures. Early historic textual evidence of this may be found in the Sumerian descent of Inanna, where the underground goddess and the goddess of death, Ereshigal, is in the process of giving birth. Just as the more ancient figures, Medusa too is winged, and she has snaky hair. That is, she embodies both the serpentine and the Avarian aspects of the Neolithic bird-slash-snake goddesses, even though she does not have the characteristics of the earliest depictions. In Neolithic Europe, death and rebirth were tied together in the tomb, which served as a ritual place for rebirth. The tomb could also represent the womb. In her death aspect, a goddess such as Medusa turns people to stone, a form of death since all human activity ceases for those thus ossified. Many Indo-European female monsters carry bird and snake iconography. Baltic witches, Raganas, take the shape of crows with snakes in their hair. Virgil in the Aeneid gives snaky association to the Furies, the Dire, Sirens and the Harpies and many of these fearsome figures are winged as well. Wings were added to Medusa's iconography around 800 BCE by the Greeks, and later texts describe her as winged as well. In the portrayal of Medusa from Miletus, Medusa is associated with snakes, but she is not snaky herself, i.e. she doesn't have the snaky body that we sometimes see today. Nonetheless, she accrued the iconography of the Neolithic bird and snake goddess, the great goddess of birth, death and regeneration. Like a resh girl with her leaky hair, Medusa with her snaky hair is also a birth giver. But in Medusa's case, she gives birth as she is dying, whereas the earlier Sumerian myth, the process of death led to regeneration. So what do I mean when I say Medusa gave birth and death? Well, to understand that, we have to go back to the myth of her and Perseus. Perseus was the son of Zeus and Danae, the daughter of King Acrisius. When Perseus was born, King Acrisius was afraid that Perseus would one day kill him, so he cast Danae and Perseus into the sea in a wooden chest. Thankfully, Danae prayed to the god Poseidon and the chest came ashore on an island of Seraphos, where a fisherman found them and took them in. This fisherman was actually the brother of King Polydectes, and he was not a nice king, so to say. However, eventually over time, King Polydectes fell in love with Danae, and he did what he thought was most appropriate to demonstrate his feelings. Um, he made her his slave. Perseus grew up and he wanted to protect his mother. However, King Polydectes knew Perseus would protect her at all costs, as Perseus eventually grew into a strong, intelligent and protective young man. So Polydectes made up a plan to keep Perseus from overpowering him. He sent him on what was seemingly an impossible mission to get the head of the Gorgon Medusa. As the son of Zeus, Perseus got help from the gods on his quest to find and behead Medusa. Hades, god of the underworld, gave Perseus a cap of invisibility. Hermes, the god of travel, gave Perseus a pair of winged sandals. Athena, god of wisdom, gave Perseus a reflective bronze shield. And Hephaestus, god of fire and forge, gave Perseus a sword. Using the gifts from the gods, Perseus eventually located and entered Medusa's cave. 
Upon finding her asleep, Perseus took the reflective bronze shield from Athena and held it up to use it as a mirror to focus on the sleeping Medusa and aim his sword at her, making sure that were she to awake, he would only make eye contact with her via the reflection of the shield. As Perseus crept closer to Medusa, he wielded the sword that Hephaestus had given him and beheaded her. As Medusa was beheaded, she birthed the children that Poseidon had impregnated with her with, Pegasus, the winged horse, and Chrysaea, the giant, out of her neck. Perseus threw Medusa's head into a satchel and journeyed home. Out of all the heroic deeds conducted by Greek heroes throughout mythology, this is arguably the least heroic. Taking out a sleeping monster which hadn't caused any trouble using a bronze mirror isn't exactly dancing with death. Funnily enough, the bronze mirror is historically a priestess or shaman's tool, and it's probably reflective, haha, <laughs> pun intended, of the shamanic origins of the Medusa tale. A further shamanic influence in this mythology actually derives from the use of the Grii, whose help is necessary for Perseus to locate Medusa in the first place. The Grii were three sea hag sisters who were born with grey hair and born old, and had amongst them but one single detachable eye and tooth that they shared amongst themselves. They were actually sisters with Medusa and the other Gorgons, as well as Scylla and Thusa. I say three sisters based on the number mentioned by Pseudo Apollodorus in the Bibliotheca, but according to both Hesiod and Ovid, there's actually only two um, Grie sisters, but the large majority of artwork and poetry henceforth depicted them as three sisters. Additionally, Aeschylus doesn't describe them as old hags at all, but rather beautiful swans. Anyway, the Grii were the keeper of secrets, and they were the only ones who knew the location of their Gorgon sisters. Naturally, when Perseus came to them asking for Medusa's location, the sisters refused to divulge this information, leading to Perseus intercepting their third eye and holding it ransom until they told him. Again, it's not exactly the most heroic thing to do. It's like holding you know, a toy above a small toddler's head and saying, give me the money. On his way home, Perseus came upon Andromeda, a beautiful woman embedded into a rock who was being sacrificed to Cetus, a sea monster. And Perseus had to do what all heroes do. So he slew the monster and rescued Andromeda from the rock. Perseus then obviously wanted to marry Andromeda, but she'd already been promised to Phineas, son of Belus. But that didn't stop Perseus, who married Andromeda anyway. When Phineas found out, he attempted to fight Perseus to gain Andromeda back, but he didn't stand a chance against a man who carried a gorgon head in his sack with him, which he proudly whipped right out before the fight and turned Phineas to stone. When he returned to King Polydectes, he did the exact same thing to him, whipping the head out to turn him to stone and thus setting his mother free. So let's talk about the decapitated Medusa head. What we can see from this myth is that, in an ironic turn of events, the disembodied power of a woman is far more dangerous when in the hands of a man than when she's left alone with her own powers. Medusa became more dangerous and monstrous when her autonomy and life were taken from her. And this thus becomes a symbol of how powerful women can never be safe, even when they hide their powers away from the world and don't even use them because the second a man learns of its existence, he will seek it out to exploit it for his own gain, at the cost of the woman. Diodorus Siculus, in the mid-first century BCE, described the Gorgons as Amazon queens, ruling in the area of Lake Tritonis in North Africa, which the Greeks called Libya. Quote, but the Gorgons, having increased in power in later times, were utterly subdued, again, by Perseus, the son of Zeus, at the very time when Medusa ruled them, and at last both they, i.e. the Gorgons, and the race of the Amazons were wholly destroyed by Heracles, when, invading the lands to the west, he set up dedicatory stones in Libya, thinking that it would be terrible if, choosing to do good deeds for the general race of humanity, he should allow any of the nations to be ruled by women. Yes. Ovid also associated Medusa with Libya, and as a source of Libyan snakes. Quote, 
and as the conqueror, Perseus, hung suspended over the Libyan sands, bloody drops fell from the Gorgon's head. The earth receiving them turned them into manifold snakes, whence that land is full and infested with snakes. As the serpent goddess of the Libyan Amazons, for example, Medusa represented women's wisdom, as the snakes on her head reflect strong mythological symbols associated with wisdom and power, healing, immortality, and rebirth. Two second century Greek writers attested to the ongoing recognition of the complexity and power of Medusa. Lucian echoed the tradition of Medusa's beauty and claimed it was the beauty of the Gorgons themselves which paralyzed men not a secondary power. Pausanias, writing approximately 150 CE, told a humoristic story in which Medusa is the African Amazon ruling over those who lived near Lake Triton. It's a very similar story to the first, however, in this one... No, 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 please, I'm, I'm filming. No, please. No, no, please, please. I'm fi I know, very similar story. However, in this story, uh, Perseus goes to war with Medusa, cuts off her head and takes it to Greece. Then he buried Medusa's head in the Angora in Argos in order to protect the city. According to classicist Jean-Pierre Vernon, Medusa appears as both the figure and mask in Greece from the 7th century BCE onward, but one constant feature dominates all her representations, the frontal view of her face. Medusa is similar to Dionysus in this aspect, because Dionysus is the only Olympian god represented in full face. This frontality seems to signify both the special proximity to mortals and the particular power over them that they share. Medusa fascinated the West long after antiquity. From the medieval period through to the Renaissance, the story of Perseus and Medusa is often recorded abstractly as a Christian allegory for the triumph of virtue over vice, and from the Renaissance through to the Romantic period, it sometimes serves as a pretext for the grotesque. Medusa's mutilated body, which we so often see throughout art, is a symbol of how man has been able to deal with women by relegating them to visual objectivity. The history of women's images in Western culture is the history of an attempt to diffuse the power of female eros, that being the assertion of the life force in women and of creative energy empowered within it. And we can't go on about talking about Medusa without touching briefly on Freud, because if there is a myth that he can defile, Freud will defile it. We can always rely on him to make everything about the phallus, and don't worry, he did. So, in a short text titled Medusa's Head, Freud regarded Medusa as a primordial woman whose snake hair ambiguously resembled... Um, how do I say this, the unkempt bush and the terror of petrification was actually indeed an allegory for the fear of castration. In his view, these Medusian genitals petrify man with the terror of castration, but they also arouse him and make him stiff with delight. Can we see what Freud did there? Freud sees this transformation of effect in apotropaic terms. Quote, for becoming stiff means an erection. It has... God. Thus, in the original situation, it offers consolation to the spectator. He is still in possession of a penis, and the stiffening reassures him of this fact. I really hate this man. For Freud, the decapitated head slash castrated genitals are so terrifying that they represent, quote, the terrifying genitals of the mother which, yes, is a very confused analogy. <sighs> We're not getting any better. Jungian psychologist Eric Newman also associated the head of Medusa with, quote, the womb in its frightening aspect. He connected the protruding tongue and serpents with the phallus, obviously, and identified Medusa as the terrible mother because psychologists at the time, irregardless as to whether they were Jungian or Freudian, were obsessed with connecting the feminine with fear and analysed Medusa entirely through the male lens. You see, they only saw her as a threat to men, despite the myth never saying anything about such a specification. Medusa could petrify anyone or any animal, but to modern scholars and psychologists, her only victim was the man.
Yet if we look at her myth, she is the only victim. First, she's a victim of sexual assault. Then she's the victim of a curse. And then finally, she is the victim of murder. Finally, we need to look at Medusa's gaze itself. Hazel Barnes explains that Medusa's gaze is so disturbing because it constitutes judgment of the self from outside the self, judgment which can neither be controlled or even known precisely. The look of the other, which reveals to me my object side, judges me, categorizes me, it identifies me with my external acts and appearances, with myself or others. It threatens, by ignoring my free subjectivity, to reduce me to the status of a thing in a world. In short, it reveals my physical and my psychic vulnerability, my fragility. Perseus cannot face the chance of having his lens inverted and mirrored back to him. So, to protect himself from the female gaze, he destroys it. As Bowers writes, men feared the female gaze and their defence against having their own free subjectivity ignored, their vulnerability and fragility revealed, and their world shared, was to destroy the female subjectivity. Other scholars, in an interesting turn of events, have actually linked the gaze of Medusa to myths about menstruation. Aristotle, for example, believed in the corrupting influence of women and claimed menstruating women tarnish a bright mirror when they look at it, causing the mirror to form a cloudy, bloody spot on its surface. In The Mirror of Medusa, his 1983 study of the Medusa myth and the demonization of narcissism in the Western culture, Tobin Sabers argues persuasively that both Medusa and Athena, as well as Medusa and Perseus, are in fact doubles. Perseus becomes Medusa when he uses her head as a weapon to kill his enemies, appropriating her deadly gaze and actualizing Medusa's threat on humanity that she actually never did herself. He uses her monstrous nature and becomes the monster that Medusa never was in act. She was but in form, but he takes the form of a hero, and thus his monstrous deeds are seen as heroic, whereas her form as a monster would make any deeds seem monstrous and therefore threatening. But she did nothing. In Pindar's Odes, Perseus, through the Medusa head, actually turned all the inhabitants of the island of Seraphus, men and women alike, into stone. And then she argues that Athena serves as Medusa's devil because Athena, as the most masculine of the female goddesses, uh, reflects Medusa in her birth, as her birth from the head of Zeus mirrors the birth of Medusa's children from her neck after her death. Additionally, obviously, uh, the myth of Medusa can be read as a deflection of women's erotic power. As Audrey Lord suggests, the erotic is a resource within each of us that lies in a deeply female and spiritual plane, firmly rooted in the power of the unexpressed or unrecognised feeling. Women empowered with the erotic, which is born of chaos, are dangerous. By pruning the erotic to mere sensation, enemies of women radically diminish female power because they rob them of their psychic and emotional being and we see through Perseus's shield, literally deflecting her power, that he cannot look directly upon the ugly, non-virginal monster that she has become. Medusa has become a very fond figure within feminist spaces because in her, millions of women over the centuries have seen themselves. Emily Culpepper spoke about her own experience saying, the Gorgon has much vital literary life saving information to teach women about anger, rage, power, and the release of the determined aggressiveness sometimes needed for survival. Patricia Clindine's Jopling explained why the artist is drawn to Medusa, saying, behind the victim's heads that turn men to stone may lie the victim stoned to death by man. If Medusa has become a central figure for the woman artist to struggle with, it is because, herself a silenced woman, she has been used to silence other women. Medusa's an interesting figure. I thought this is quite a, a nice introduction to her myth as a whole and the origins of the many different types. But if there's anything else you'd like me to really get into with Medusa, there's a lot out there. Please let me know down below. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Thank you to my wonderful Patreons for supporting this channel and making it possible. And thank you also to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. 
If you like this video, please like and subscribe. And also, if you have any recommendations for any other figures you'd like me to cover mythology-wise, please leave them down below. And until next time, I shall see you soon for another video. And remember, books save lives, so keep reading.